For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. 1 John three sixteen through 18 continues, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. When all the little kids leave, it's like half the congregation goes. <laughs> but that's a good thing that we got that many youngsters here. Father in heaven, we humbly come before your throne today, Lord, as a blessed nation, a holy priesthood, as your children, Father. Help us to realize the gift that you have given us of eternal life, the gift that you have given us to be called the sons of God. Father, help us to not take lightly this salvation, to work it out with fear and trembling. Not that we fear uh, condemnation, Lord, or your judgment, but that we fear you in a holy way, that we realize that your love and our calling, Lord, that we give up our lives to serve you, that we were created beings to serve you and we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ to serve you even more because of that great love that you've lavished upon us. Open up our, our ears to hear the words of the Spirit today and help us to walk in sync with the Spirit as the Spirit gives gifts. Um, to us each, Lord, to be tied together in unity as the body of Christ so that when people do see our good deeds that it glorifies our Father in heaven and we're able to tell them about the precious blood of Jesus Christ that it has redeemed us, Father. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, I don't know about you guys, but I've just about got this sin problem kicked. Yeah, that's funny. I'm being funny. <laughs> don't think that I'm not. You know, aren't we so... <laughs> yeah, don't do that. There's plenty of things like that. Uh, you know, as we look at our lives and as we sit back, it's easy to put ourselves kind of in the position that King David was in as we read through Second Samuel. I hope you read that. I hope you looked at a character study there. I'm not going to talk about it much today, just an introduction. I mean, the way Second Samuel ends... David looks over his kingdom, and we don't associate with kings and kingdoms this much today in this democracy, but we do associate with I and what I've done and this and that, and it's careful not to fall into that trap and say that, oh, I've done all this for God, but if we look at how sinful we are, our filthy rags, we have to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have to realize that by His blood, by faith alone, we're saved. And by the power of the Spirit, we can live differently. And I told you last week, and I'm going to say it again this week, there are consequences to our sins. At the end of 2 Samuel again, didn't that just put your spirit in distress? David wanted a census of his kingdom, and it displeased God. Because he didn't give glory and honor to God and didn't realize his part in this world. Do you realize your part in this world? as a child of God, that you realize what great love God has lavished upon you, that you would be called a child of God. So are you living by the power of the Spirit? Or are you, and I'm going to read this part of 1 John, just so we remember it again, then we're going to dig into 1 John some. Or 
if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living the truth. Like I said, it's easy to get caught up in what we do for God rather than the sin we still have. I'm not close to licking my sin and being finished with it. In word and in action and in thought and everything I'm going to be accountable for. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or the NLT says wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, though we're calling God a liar and showing that His word has no place in our hearts. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. Yes, that's our goal, entire sanctification. And we should be trying more and more, but not by our own might and own power, but by submitting ourselves to Jesus Christ and being empowered by the Spirit, by realizing it's not about our kingdom, it's about His kingdom. It's not about my will, it's about His will. About denying myself and taking up my cross and following after my Lord and Savior who humbled Himself and gave Himself as an atoning sacrifice for my sins. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Wow. Are you getting a glimpse of this great salvation that you have through Jesus Christ? Don't take it for granted. What if you died tonight? Number one, would you have eternal life? But number two, would there be any regrets that you could have, should have, would have done these things? Because if there's anything in your life that's going that way now, you need to humble yourself before God and get on the right path. Because as you see through Second Samuel, First and Second Samuel, that your sins do have consequences. Yeah, you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ if you believe and put your faith and trust in Him, but there are still consequences to our sins. And we have a responsibility that goes all the way back to before the law was given and when the law was given to train up our children to be a holy, set-apart people, to live a life that brings glory and honor to God, and how much more as a child of the Most High because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So you should have read Second Samuel to the end. You should have read Nahum, finished First John, Second John, Third John, and started in Colossians. But today I'm going to concentrate on First John, so if you want to be turning there, you can. John was a young man full of zeal probably the youngest of the disciples that followed Jesus. And he had a lot of zeal, but it was misdirected, probably as much as Peter, if not worse, because he didn't have some of the maturity that Peter had. But even in our own maturity, <laughs> we figure out we're real childish at heart sometimes, aren't we? Self-centered. He wanted to rain down fire from heaven to wipe out God's enemies. But later he was known as the disciple of love. And if you can't see that from the Gospel of John and from his letters to the church, all he talked about was living as a child of light and a child of love because you are a child of the kingdom of God. He was the last of the apostles probably alive at this point. He's writing a letter to the church because the church is being affected again by another gospel. We fight a spiritual battle. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a direct front. Sometimes it's a little, we don't even know where it's coming from. It's sneaky, it's devious. Isn't that what the devil does? He's a deceiver. He's been doing it for the beginning of time. He will keep doing it. And when you become saved, when you become called by God, you become his child, he attacks you even more when you try to live for himself. That's when you start thinking, oh, I'm through with this sin. Oh, don't ever think that. <laughs> because that's when he attacks you in those areas. He has no power, no authority in your life, though. Jesus said that. And the church was being preached another gospel, that Jesus, a Gnostic gospel, that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh, or that the Spirit came upon him and then left it at his death, or whatever teachings they had. And that reason was to get the church to be inactive, and those that were in the church that weren't truly of the church would walk away. If you are part of the body of Christ, then you should be maturing in the Spirit to be more like Christ in this world. One of the things I say all the time, and I'll say again, what child does not want to grow up and especially be like their father? And all we've got to do is look at Jesus Christ, what He did, what He taught, and obey His commandments, because if we're His sheep, we follow His voice. So John writes a letter because there are those falling away and they're wondering what's going on and they're wondering about these different gospel messages, but this is not the gospel at all. 
John was an eyewitness, and he goes back to teaching what Jesus taught exactly. If you read the, the uh, letters, you see that it's exactly what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, plus what he taught beyond that. A life that's lived differently because you know the law. Now you have the, the power to live it through the Holy Spirit. You have the authority to be Jesus' hands and feet in this world. So if you want to be his disciple, you deny yourself. You take up your cross and follow after him. If you want to be his disciple, you don't longingly look back at the world because you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be his disciple, you follow the master's voice to be like him. And when you do sin, you have an advocate in the Father. You get down on your knees and you thank God for his saving grace. That's why David was a man after God's own heart. It's hard to see it if you don't look at that perspective because you look at all the things that David did, you would say he started off right, kind of like Saul, but then where did he wind up in the end? But when he was confronted with sin, he turned to God and asked for forgiveness even though there were consequences. Look at the end of 2 Samuel. Which punishment do you want to choose? Wow. The three letters of John reiterate the actual teachings of Jesus in the flesh from one who touched Jesus, lived with Jesus, followed him, gave up his life as a fisherman to be a fisher of men. Which if you go back and read that again, Jesus will turn you into a fisher of men. It's not something you do on your own. It's something the Holy Spirit does. By you condemning the world, by that rethinking of your mind that the Holy Spirit is giving you, to recall everything that Jesus taught and did, all of the scriptures, so that you are more like Christ, that this world becomes strangely dim and you're a child of light shining brightly into this world. 1 John 1, 1. He said, Our hands have touched Jesus. Don't believe these other teachers that have said this and that. They weren't there. We have touched the words of life. Logos understanding that God has given men above the other created beings, a knowledge to be able to choose right from wrong, a knowledge to be able, as God comes to you, to begin to comprehend how great God's love is for you. 1 John 1, 2, Therefore we proclaim. What do we proclaim? Because we know the words of life, we proclaim eternal life. That you believe because God loved you so much, you believe that, and you believe in Jesus Christ, that He's the Messiah, the chosen one of God. You cannot save yourself. There is no this plus Jesus. There's no Jesus plus this. It's all because of Jesus. And you believe, and you are born again from above. You are a child of God. But you should be maturing and growing to be an adult child of God. All you need is that childlike faith but you should be growing and maturing more and more to be like your Father in heaven. Again, what child, once they get a comprehension, would not want to be like their good father would be? So if you die tonight, are you 100% certain that you would have eternal life? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? But then you've got to go back to Jesus' teachings and we'll read further in John. If you have, then you're part of the vine. So are you producing fruit? If you're not producing fruit, but you're part of the vine still, there's pruning to be done. If you're not part of, the, part of the vine, there's cutting off and being thrown into the fire. And there are many that will say, Lord, Lord, we knew you. And he said, you did not know me. You did not have fellowship with me. You did not have koinonia. You didn't know me. You're not a part of my family. You know Sherry. You don't know Sherry like I know Sherry because she's my wife. I know her more intimately. Do you know Jesus Christ intimately? Is he your brother? Do you know God because you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb and the Spirit of God indwells you and changes you and matures you into the image of Christ? This is the message. 1 John 3, 4, we also proclaim fellowship. That you have that fellowship, that koinonia. Oh, that also means unity. 
That also means coming along for a mission together that we know we have the same purpose and desire. We were, no, we were created in God's image to bring Him glory and honor. And now we proclaim the message of reconciliation as though God were making His appeal through us to mankind. So are we doing that? Is that our mission? Are we letting Jesus change us into fishers of men? Or are we still worried about the things of this world that we need to get done? 1 John 1, 5, God is light and there is no darkness at all. No darkness. He is light that exposes darkness and a child of His is a child of light that should expose the darkness in this world. <coughs> Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your way of thinking so that it changes your heart so that you will light up this world for Jesus Christ. And when you do sin, make sure that you get down on your knees and ask for forgiveness. Take whatever consequences come and let the Lord lift you up in His mighty power to be more like Christ. You've taken on a partnership when you said that you believed that you would deny yourself, that you would take up your cross, that you would do whatever and we can't do it on our own. And every time we try, we wind up somewhere we don't want to be, don't we? Me trying to fight my own sinful battles is <laughs> never going to happen. But through God's power and God's might, I find forgiveness. And then as I turn to the Spirit, I see that those things do grow strangely dim. I still fight just like Paul did. Why do I do the things that I do not do? My, my spirit desires it, but my flesh is weak. Just wait till something comes along and like Fred said, you've prayed for patience and you get the most annoying person in your life. And even if you didn't pray for it, God still knows your heart and knows how you need to be changed. So you have to walk in fellowship with the Holy Spirit day in, day out, in His Word, with each other, praying and asking for forgiveness and never thinking that you're close to getting done with sin why I started it off that way as a joke. 1 John 1, 6-7, If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So we've got to come out of that darkness, totally out of that darkness, because there is no darkness in our Father at all. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we do have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, <coughs> His Son, purifies us from all sin. Hmm. In the church, there's so much division today, so many people leaving churches, so many people not going to church because some, what someone did to them, vice versa. Do we have unity and fellowship with one another? Or is it Satan trying to distract us from our missions at the body of Christ in this world? If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sins. How can I be angry at my brother, even if he's the most annoying thing in the world and has done this or that to me? How can I let the sun go down on my anger? It would be like I was committing murder in my heart. Because Christ Jesus, while I was His enemy, laid down His life for me silently before His accusers. And even when His accusers were doing everything they did to him and said, come down off that Christ if, that cross, if you're the Son of God. He refused to and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now that's love that I patterned myself after. Every time Sherry and I get into arguments, oh, we don't get into arguments, and so forth, you know, what helps, the only thing that helps is to realize it's not about me and to realize that I'm supposed to love her more as Christ loves and gave himself for the church to present her as a spotless bride before him. I don't have to be right in an argument, although I think I do most of the time <laughs> until the Holy Spirit talks to me. I have to realize that I'm supposed to be like Christ to build up, to edify. So why would I want to say anything that doesn't build up and edify as, as Scripture tells us? Hmm. If you die tonight, are you 100% certain of your salvation? The reason I ask it again is because are you walking in fellowship? 
John writes this letter to let the church know whether they have eternal life or not because so many in the church are leaving following this other gospel and it's getting people to question their faith. If you've been covered by the blood of the Lamb, you're covered. Your sins are forgiven. Don't let that be as an excuse to sin because that was part of the Gnostic gospel from some of the people. The flesh is flesh. It's evil. Go ahead and sin all you want to and get done with it. <laughs> doesn't work that way. You are called to be wholly set apart for God. That's why I love reading the Old Testament with the New Testament. And I go back into John's time. They didn't have the letters of the New Testament. They preached Jesus through the Old Testament, through the law. Through the lens of Jesus, you could see that, oh, if I have anger in my heart, that's wrong because God is a God of love. And even as, my, as, my, as the enemy of God putting the nails into Jesus' hands and feet. He still loved me. So how can I not love God and how can I not love others as Jesus summed up to be the greatest commandment? So are you walking in the light? There's your proof. Are you walking in the light as Jesus is in the light? He said it's better if I leave this world and the Holy Spirit comes to you and he also prayed to the Father that, it, that, he, that the Father didn't take you from this world, but protected you from the evil one. So that by your faith you would walk as a child of light and others would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is the privilege that we have, the responsibility that we have as a child of God and together as a church. That's why we have to be unified. That's why we have to understand brotherly love and have fellowship with one another. But these false teachers tell you you can live however, you can do whatever you want. Do not let them whisper in your ear. 1 John 1, 8 to 10. They must, some of these teachers must have confessed they were without sin and been done with it. You know what John called them? Liars! That's why I started off that way. <laughs> no. Whenever, like I said, I'll say it again, making my own self exposed. Whenever I think I'm done with this sin, it seems to rear up its ugly head. Because then I'm thinking about what I've done again. I'm doing a census of my kingdom, how far I've come, rather than humbling myself before the throne and saying, you've given me, like you said, Barry, thanks today. You've given me the breath of life. If my leg is hurting so bad, at least I have a leg whatever it might be, in all circumstances, pray and give thanks. We have so much to be thankful for. I was just thankful yesterday that all the rain wasn't snow because <laughs> we got a lot of rain. But are you thankful in all things, using it to praise and glorify God for the good things that He has done? And top of the list has to be saving grace to such a wretched person as I. If we realize our sin, if we confess our sins, then He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even the fact that we thought we were getting better than we were in our own mind. These false teachers may not have realized, they probably thought they were part of the kingdom of God, but they were teaching another gospel. It's Jesus and only Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb, by your faith, and by your testimony, that the light will extinguish the darkness. That won't happen fully until Jesus comes, but that's what we should live our lives like. So 1 John chapter 2, My dear children, I write this to you, so that you will not sin. So that you will not. Not that you might not. Not that, okay, you sin and that's okay, because you, you're covered. But if you sin, you have an advocate, but the purpose the, and the, the point here is not to sin. I don't know, again, any child, I go back to the child so you can th think of it this way. I don't know any child who would think that heaven is a place where there's still sin. But I talk to so many adults and they say, well, heaven's got to be a better place. <laughs> heaven is a perfect place. Whatever your conception is of that, it is a place where God dwells. And there is no more unrighteousness, no darkness whatsoever. 
And if you're going to live as children of light fully, then again, why are you not letting the Spirit transform and change you into Jesus now while you're still living on this world, while it can make a difference? Because when Jesus comes again, you can't witness to that friend, that enemy, that child, that parent, that brother, that sister. And so many reasons, the reason you're not witnessing to them now is you don't have fellowship with them. You're estranged for some reason because you've held on to this grudge. But love keeps no records of wrongs. Love doesn't think of itself. Lightness, light extinguishes darkness. Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all. When the world was dark for three hours... Jesus' light was shining on the ones who put their faith in Him. So what's happening in your life? 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. This proof in the pudding, so to speak. As James says, tell me that your faith is there and I don't see your works. He said, I don't believe you. And that was probably the first letter to the church, where this is probably one of the last letters to the church besides Revelation. Are we keeping His commands? Well, I just told you I think I am from time to time, but I'm not. But I can look at my life and see that things that before that were appealing to me just aren't anymore. Satan's lost his grip on that. But like I said, when I think of something else that I'm doing quite well with, I realize that... Mm -mm. But I do see a change. Do you see a change in your life? And it didn't come from me. It comes from reading God's Word, from getting on my knees, from calling out to my Father, and in my weakness realizing that I am a sinner and calling out for more grace upon grace upon grace, which He lavishly bestows upon me. What good Father doesn't give good gifts, and how much more will God, if I keep on asking, keep on knocking, give me the Holy Spirit to do His will in this world? 1 John 2, 5 and 6. But if anyone does obey the word, the love of God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Here we've got this call to maturity. The more that we put sin behind us, not by our own might, but because it comes foreign to us in the Spirit... It gives us the thoughts instead of the flesh giving us the thoughts because we are, oh, drunk in the Spirit rather than drunk on wine. The more that we're made complete, the more that we're made like Christ in this world until that total completion comes. So whoever com claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Is this a priority in your life? Are you doing it by your own means or are you doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit? Jesus is clear. He said, if you want to be great, you need to become the least of these. And didn't He prove that in what He did? He humbled Himself, became flesh and blood, and then died for the people that rejected Him, that mocked Him, that cursed Him, that crucified Him. 1 John 2, 7-8. What did Jesus command then? How did He live? Was it a self-centered love or a selfless love? that would die for even his enemies. It's an old command. We know it from the beginning, but we have a new command written in because we know now that we're not only supposed to love, but we're supposed to love as Christ loved. Verse 8, I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you. Did you catch that part? You can't just look at Jesus as a moral teacher, as just your Savior. You've got to realize He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Pledge your allegiance to Him and live for Him. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Do you realize what that verse says? Look out in the world. The darkness isn't going away in this world. It's getting worse and worse. He's not talking about the world here. John's talking about you. 
that darkness is passing in your life because you're coming to the understanding, because you study God's Word, you fellowship with one another, you get together in God's Word, you pray, you realize that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, that you are a priest, a holy nation, that you are His ambassador, and this forever changes you with the power of the Holy Spirit changing your heart, that new heart that God gave you because He's your child. Oh, you don't doubt then that you're His child. Sure, the devil might whisper in your ear, what if I did die tonight? But the more that you spend time in here, the more you know I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. Get away from me. The darkness is passing away and the light is filling every crevice of your life. Is that the case? Are you born again? Is your light shining? Is it seen in the way that you love one another? Do you understand this? Are you still focusing on the old the old ways. Is the Spirit transforming your mind? But you've got to condemn the world to do that. You don't live for the things of the world. You don't do things by your own might. You do whatever God is impressing upon you by the Holy Spirit to walk in step with the Spirit so that the light of love fills every crevice and the darkness in your life is being extinguished till it is completely gone. If you die tonight, are you 100% certain of your salvation? John is very clear in what he's saying here. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if he's changing you, and you're walking in the light of love as Jesus commanded, you don't have anything to worry about, no matter if half of you walk out of here today into the darkness. Now, I don't want that to happen at all. Don't get that. I'm talking about the church again there because people were leaving the church because of the false teachings, because of the persecutions, because of all these things they were taught. And if you were taught any other kind of gospel, a prosperity gospel or anything else, when the times got hard, I'm sure you would question whether God loves you or not. Again, going back to when I taught the youth so much, they couldn't understand how God could love them because of the sinful things they did. But God loves you in spite of your sin and shame. But they also didn't want to come out of the darkness because their deeds would be exposed and they knew they'd have to live. They knew all of it with a childlike faith with not much understanding of the Bible, but they choose to go hold on to the darkness instead of the light. You have claimed to hold on to the light. So are you walking as a child of light? If you are, there is no doubt in your mind that if you die tonight, you would spend an eternity with heaven, in heaven with Jesus. Matthew 7 Verses 15 to 24. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. But by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Well, I'm not a bad tree. Let me see here. Am I a good tree? Am I bearing good fruit, fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit being grafted into the vine of Jesus Christ? Do I take that pruning so that I can produce more fruit in my life? Because it brings God glory and honor for the great things He's done for me. A good tree, verse 18, cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John's just reiterating the words of Jesus here. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The problem is that so many times we hear these words, but we don't put them into practice. For whatever reason, the fear that we have in this world, the love that we have for this world, the uncertainty that we have in ourselves, whatever it may be, we don't let the Spirit of God transform us into the image of Christ. That's what our life as a Christian is all about. Being a child of light to where there's no darkness anymore and the world sees it. So that as Peter said, when they see what you do in this world, and he's talking about submission there, how we submit, then I, they want to ask us about the hope that we have. What makes us different in this world? 
So is Jesus' light extinguishing the darkness in your life so that you can light this world? Are you doing a good job? I started off there. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness, 1 John 2, 9. So this is how he puts the proof in there again. Oh, my light's shining. I'm doing good. I'm changing. Oh, but I don't like Brother Joe over there. We don't have a Joe in here, right? Because <laughs> he did this or that. How could I think that? But yet I have. But that grows strangely, strangely dim. But I still say some things sometimes it's not edifying. Why would I do that? Especially with our family. I'm thankful for what you said for your thankfulness, the family of God that you have. That we can come together. That the God of all comforts gives us comfort so that we can comfort each other. So the God of all joy gives us joy so that we can share with each other. So that we can be thankful that we can lift each other up, tie together the body of Christ to serve the head of the church, Jesus Christ, who loved himself and gave himself for the church to present her spotless on her wedding day. 1 John 2, 10, 11, Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. There's your proof. And there is nothing in them to make them stumble. No words that aren't edifying, no thoughts that shouldn't be there. Very clear definition of who is saved, who has that peace that surpasses all understanding. Verse 11, but, total contradiction here, anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Sad, sad state to be in as a child of light who's still living with the darkness extinguishing the light. 1 John 2, 12 through 14. John writes to little boys, to fathers, to young men. Women, you're in here, don't worry. It's just the age of the day. He's writing to the little, to the old, to the maturing. Every aspect of your age in mankind this message is for all of them. It's not too hard to comprehend. All you need is childlike faith to come to Christ. But as you are one of these different stages, you should realize even more what God has done for you and be living a life that shows that even more. 1 John 2, 15-17 Do not love the world or anything in the world. So I've got past my brother. Where am I still at in this world? Oh, I hate that word idols. I don't have idols in my life, do I? But what do I spend my money on, my time on, everything else? Nothing wrong with enjoying things this world. Sharon and I are going on vacation. You guys know that coming up. But is that what you live for and long for? Can you not live without this and that? Do you rely on this so much, the comforts that you have, that you're afraid to ask God for daily bread? And then would you be satisfied and thankful if that's what you got? It's hard to even imagine in this country. I have never, ever wondered where my next meal was coming from. I might not have wanted it, <laughs> but I've never wondered where I would get the nourishment from. And I know who the bread of life is. I know where living water comes from. So I feed and feed and feed. And what I try to think of again is how much time that I spent thinking about that meal, preparing that meal, cooking that meal, cleaning up. Oh, I better spend that much time filling myself with spiritual food for sure, if not a lot more than that. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. You've got to be maturing. You've got to be growing if you want this confidence. And if you don't have this, here's the thing about this. All you've got to do at this point is ask God for forgiveness to change you. Don't hold on to those things anymore. You have an advocate in the Father who is, who is claiming to you and you have the advocate living inside of you that is telling you you are God's and getting you to maturity if you will listen and obey. Hear the words of Jesus through the Holy Spirit and through His Word. For everything in the world, in this world, 
because we live in a fallen creation. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So John is teaching a, a, a confidence in salvation here, but he's teaching a pro progression in the, tr the walk of a believer also. Verses 18 to 23, as the last hour approaches, and all of you think that's more than today, and it has to be because yesterday is gone, isn't it? We're one day closer regardless. That means you have less opportunity than you had yesterday to live for Jesus Christ. As the hour is approaching, the urgency is approaching. Is the darkness in you being changed to light so that you can be a child of light and live as a child of light while you still have the breath of life in you? Anyone who does not live this way can claim all they want to to be of Christ, but really they're an anti-Christ. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. You're either gathering into the kingdom or you're scattering. You have been given the seeds, the word of life. And the farmer went out to plant his seeds and it's just by his grace and by his privilege that you've been able to be a part of that. Grow and produce fruit. Verses 24 to 29, John wrote this letter to the churches so they would not be led astray so that they would remain in the vine and produce fruit and know that they have eternal life, confidence, and hope, regardless of the false teachings, regardless of persecution, regardless of those that were walking out of the church. So then we get to 1 John 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Because he's got to this point, if you've made it this far, can you begin to fathom the great love that God has for you? the privilege that you have of be, being called a priest in the kingdom of heaven, the, the honor that you have to be an ambassador and how you have to live your life as a foreigner and sojourner in this world, fixing your eyes on Jesus because you know this is not your home and you don't want sin to reign in your life or in the, the lives of your friends, even your enemies. So you proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and you live as Christ did growing to maturity. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we would be called children of God. And then he says, and that is what we are. So live as a child of God until Jesus returns. 1 John 3, 3, you can put a therefore in there. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. He says it over and over again. He gives a contrast between light and dark, saved and not saved, following Jesus and gathering into the kingdom or following the devil and scattering. He gives it constantly throughout this letter. Purify yourselves. Cleanse yourselves just as he is pure. Verses 4 to 10. Continue, continuing to practice a life of sin is lawlessness. You know, God gave the law. We know we're supposed to hold on to His holy standards, but we know that we can't. We know that that's why the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ over and over again because we can't do it on our own. But Jesus did it for us. And all you have to do is put your faith in Him. So then, once you do, let Him lead you into maturity. Don't let the Holy Spirit be foreign to you, but let the Holy Spirit fellowship with you and guide you into all truth. You know what lawlessness is? Oh, I'm glad Bonnie's not here today. Because she says when I use this, it convicts her. Lawlessness is not the absence of law. Because the law is still there. Lawlessness is I make the law into what I want it to be. Did God really say not eat from that tree? No, He didn't say that. Oh, but I do desire to gain wisdom, and you said I wouldn't die. Let me change the law a little bit. Here's what I use for an example that always convicts Bonnie. What's the speed limit out there? Okay? We all know the speed limit. It is the law. We all disobey that law. Even if you do the best of your ability and you try not to speed, there are times when you say, oops, I was speeding. 
lawbreaker, man of lawlessness. Now, my point is not to convict you, <laughs> not speeding. But when you realize and take that and apply that to other things in your life that you say, oh, I know it says to love my enemies, but that guy over there, or whatever it is in your life. Examine my heart, oh God. And when you point out what's wrong in me, give me the ability and the power through your spirit to overcome the sin that is still plaguing my life. And I long for the day when this sin is all gone, when my children won't have to face it, my grandchildren won't have to face it, and their grandchildren won't have to face it. So I will write your laws on the letters of my home. I will teach and preach it and live it, but I need your power to do it, and I know you've given me the authority and the power. So Lord God, help me to learn from the Holy Spirit to be like Christ. Because there will come a day when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. There will come a day when we don't have a chance anymore to proclaim righteousness to a world who desperately needs it. The one who does, does, does what is sinful is of the devil, verse 8. Let me go back to verse 5 for, first. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. It's just not just the penalty in our life, but the power in our life. Scripture is clear over that. That we become holy, set apart, sanctified. That we are sanctified and that we grow to total sanctification. Because in Him there is no sin. He came to take away the sins of the world so that we could freely serve Him. And who the Son has set free is free indeed. But verse 8, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Don't take this scripture out of context and twist it like so many people do. You've got to read the whole letter. You won't continue practicing living in the darkness. You'll be brought into light, not by your own power, but by the power of God's Word and through His Spirit to be a child like God. You can't stay over here or you're not. You've got to be progressing here because if you are a child of light the darkness will be exposed and you will come out of the darkness and into the light and live as the child of light because again the teaching of that day was you can stay right here just fine and dandy and you'll be okay you're covered it doesn't work that way if you truly believe you will have deeds that prove it because there's no way that you can't live for the one who loved you so much. If you understand that love, you live as a child of light and a child of love. You can't do anything else because you're born again. And then hopefully you grow to maturity. Verse 10, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Oh, and then he adds this in here. Inspired word of God, every word. <laughs> Nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Oh, that person over there. How long am I going to keep on having that animosity in my heart? It's all about relationships and the fact that our relationship is right here, that we do our best to have the relationships right here. And there's no way I can overcome these things because every time I think I'm doing pretty good again, this person does this again, which brings up these emotions here that I didn't think were there anymore. Oh, that's me. That's why I said that about Sherry. If I don't watch it, we get into his and hers, mine and ours, and who's right and who's wrong, when all I'm supposed to do is love as Christ loved to present her spotless. That's a self-sacrificing love that tames the tongue, which I will never do, and lives to build her up, then it doesn't seem to matter what that argument was about or who was right or wrong, does it? First John 3, 11 through 15. Better not let the sun go down on your anger. Remember Cain? How could he kill his brother? 
True brotherly love. Do you understand that? As Christ loved you. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. There's the proof again. Anyone who does not love remains in death. He is so clear contrasting light and darkness, love and hate, saved and unsaved, childish, mature. But again, that childish is a scary place to be if you're not maturing. You're not a child. You're not an infant anymore. Put away those things. The way you used to live. We know the pagans did that. We know the pagans worry about what they eat and drink and everything else. Don't worry. You know your heavenly Father is going to give you those things. And if you don't have your health, if you don't have your well-being, <laughs> when I die, it's gain. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. I wonder if John came in today and preached that in most churches, how hard it would hit to the point, but also how much repentance would there be. How can you hate your brother or sister, especially the children of God. We're not to the love your enemy part yet. We've not even got there. If you haven't noticed either, John uses the word no 16 times, 16 times, 8 times, 8 times in the last chapter. 40 times. This is how you know. No doubt in your salvation. No doubt where you're at in your walk of life. You just ask for self-examination and God will tell you where you're at in this walk of life. Because you already know it. The scriptures are there. You don't have to wear a bracelet that says, what would Jesus do? You know what He did. You know what He taught. The words are living inside of you. They're written on your hearts so that you'll be obedient and live differently. I had Mark read from John and 1 John so you could see the words here together. John 3, 16, You know him for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Childlike faith, that's all you need. 1 John 3, 16, Though is this is how we know what love is, that Christ laid down for his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Isn't that what the church did? At Pentecost, and, and the growth of the church was amazing after that, and because of the power of the Holy Spirit that had come upon people, they sold what possessions they had because they didn't consider them their own. They didn't live for their own gain anymore. They sold them so that the body of Christ wouldn't have need. And they sold them enough to the point where Scripture says there was no one in need. They accomplished the goal that was set before them. Ooh, looks a lot like heaven, doesn't it? Because why in heaven would I want someone not to have when I had? Oh, it takes me back to what Jesus said about giving that rich crop that I have and instead of saying, oh, how can I do this? Am I going to build bigger barns for myself? Instead, I ask, how can I help the kingdom of heaven, especially the brothers and sisters, so that the kingdom of heaven comes here on earth and the world sees it, that light extinguishes darkness because I'm a child of light. What would this kind of life look like? Well, it says it in the next verses. If anyone has material possessions, 1 John 3, 17, and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Uh, childlike faith. I uh, don't guess it could be. You better examine yourself. Because how could I go on living excess while this person over here was in need? Dear children... I need childlike faith. And I'm telling you this because you're claiming to be the child of God, and I hope and pray that you are. And if you are, you will see and hear what the Spirit says to the church. Let us not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. Wow. What do we know from chapter 3? Well, verse 2 said, We know that when Christ appears, we'll be like Him. Verse 5, but you know that He appeared so that He might take away our sins and that him, in Him there is no sin. No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen Him or known Him. What else do we know? 
Verse 10, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not remain does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in them. Verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Verse 19, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our, set our hearts at rest in his presence. Verse 23, and this is his command, to believe in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Pretty clear. That's why I summed up chapter 3. Now here's the time, and that's why I wanted you to read Second Samuel, First and Second Samuel that way. You saw a pattern in Samuel's life that his children didn't necessarily father because there was still some darkness in his life. You saw Saul, you, in, in him you saw David, and you saw the, the consequences of their sin. And even though David was a man after God's own heart, saved, you know what his outcome was. He still had a problem with me, myself, and I. Instead of God living because of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in my life to be like Christ. How are you living? Are you listening to the words of the Spirit? Are you grieving the Spirit in the way that you think, say, and do? Chapter 4, don't believe any false doctrines, other gospels, because they're all anti-Christ. Remember, this is what you say and what you do. It's a, Christianity is a faith that is lived out. Verses 7 through 12. And remember how Jesus has identified His own. They follow His voice. They do what He says and it will be known by the love that they have for one, other, one another. Verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. All of this faith put into action shown by brotherly love. If you can't love your brother, how are you ever going to get to the point of loving your enemy? Verse 9, this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. Verses 13 to 17. Verse 13, this is how we know again that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. All of this life of love, light of love, uh, li life, there's what I'm trying to get out, of light, comes because you know that the Spirit of God has sealed you as His child. And you listen and are changed into Christ's image. Verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how we know love is made complete made perfect, made mature among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, no fear whatsoever. In this world we are like Jesus. Hmm. Spirit, you've got a lot of work to do on me still because I'm far from being like Jesus in so many ways. Forgive me. Mold me. Make me. Make these desires fade away because of your increasing light in my life. So I turn to God's Word more. I turn to prayer more. More dependence on the one who died and empowered me to live like Him. Verses 18 to 21. Oh, these are some verses that get taken out of context again. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. 
He just wrote from the previous verse, this is how love is made complete among us so that on that day of judgment we have confidence. We, there's no fear that, we, that we're going to fall short and be one of those, Lord, Lord. In this world we're like Jesus. So the more that we know this perfect love, the more it drives out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loves us. Now I can look at that person over there a lot more and say, Joe is who we used, right? That you know what? He might be a sinner and everything, but I am acting not like Jesus at all in this world if I'm having these thoughts and stuff. And I need to go to my brother and ask forgiveness and I need to be a light that builds him up and edifies him, not have these thoughts that tear him down. Because I am a sinner saved by grace. And anyone who else is saved is saved by grace and a child of God exactly the same. And if they're not, my light needs to shine so that they can come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. How can I not live a life of love? Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. You're right back to the lawless ones that don't practice the law of God at all because they're in darkness. Wow, the circle that John has put here in his letter. Great theology here, but all he's trying to do is tell the church, either you're saved or you're not. Either you're living for Jesus or you're not. And if you want confidence in the day that he comes, then you better believe and you better start living. Simple gospel. A child would understand it again. And he has given us this command, verse 21, anyone who loves God must also love their brother or sister. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, this is how we know again. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands. I think Jesus said that was the greatest commandment, didn't He? In fact, this is love from God to keep His commands and His commands are not burdensome. For everyone of God born of God overcomes the world. In verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you died tonight, do you have a 100% certainty that you would spend eternity in the kingdom of God? Yes. If you do, then are you showing it by the way you live? Do you have fellowship with God and with one another? So is there anything that we need to put before the throne of God today? I brought in communion because communion is a way that we fellowship with God. It's not something that is magical or anything else. It's remembering the love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And on that day, He shared communion with even Judas because He wanted to have fellowship with even the one that would betray Him and hand Him over because He loved Him that much. He had fellowship with the one who would deny Him three times, but He would reinstate Him and tell Him not to fish for fish, but to fish for men to wait on the Holy Spirit to empower him and to build upon the teachings that, that he gave, to be a disciple, to follow after him. Do you have that fellowship with God and with one another? Paul warns us not to come and take in communion with having anything in our hearts. So I ask you this time to, to get rid of that. And everyone is welcome to the communion table. It's open to all that want to come and fellowship. Jesus gave his body, the bread that we have here, for our sins. Flesh and blood given for us. Flesh and blood that we can't do. He had to be fully flesh. He had to be fully God to be able to do this. To lay down His life for us. To overcome sin so that His atoning sacrifice would cover our sins once and for all. And the Old Testament is clear that it takes the life's blood being poured out. Jesus completely died. He didn't swoon. He didn't do anything else. He wasn't a spirit. He was a man that died and was brought back to life by the power of God, knowing that you have eternal life if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. No one can make you doubt any of these things. 
Do you have that fellowship with God? John and Barb, will you come to help? You can come on your own. I'm going to pray first. And then when we're done with communion, Sherry and um, Debbie still here? Okay, I didn't see her. Debbie will...